I'd like to call to order the February 5th regular meeting of the Bowling Green Board of Commissioners for 2019. I invite you to stand if you choose as we uh, are provided an invocation by our Bowling Green Police Department Chaplain Mike Holen, Holian, followed by Commissioner Joe Denning, who will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Let's pray. God of mercy and love, we give you thanks for the many blessings that we enjoy as citizens of Bowling Green, and we pray for our mayor and board of commissioners. May their dedication be an example for all in our community and us assembled here tonight. I humbly ask that your angels of wisdom be in all the decisions, discussions, deliberations made here this evening. I pray for all the various officials and department heads of our city and I ask you to graciously grant them the wisdom to govern. Give them a sense for the welfare of our people and a keen thirst for justice and righteousness. Watch over the city commission this afternoon as they deliberate all the issues facing our community. And I pray for the agenda that is set before them at this meeting. For it's in your precious and holy name that we do pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please call the roll. Commissioner Nash. Here. Commissioner Pergen. Here. Commissioner Beasley Brown. Here. Commissioner Denning. <laughs> yeah. Mayor Wilkerson. Here. We have awards and recognitions tonight? Anyone? I don't have any, Mayor. All right, but you do have some comments for us. I have uh, two items for my comment section. I'd like to tonight to present to everyone uh, this is recently released. This is our new uh, police department recruitment video. Uh, I thought it was an excellent job done on this. And I'd like to thank a couple of people in particular, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Michael Delaney, uh, JJ Myers, uh, Hunter Harris, and uh, probably a lot of other people that I can't uh, give all their names out tonight, but I uh, got some stars on the video here too that you'll see, but uh, I think this is a, a great video that showcases our uh, professional police department that we have here, and it's an excellent recruiting tool that I think will, will be put to good use. So I'd like to take a few minutes uh, to showcase this to everyone. Is our home. Where our children grow up. And where we serve our community. The Bowling Green Police Department is made up of many faces, many talents, but one purpose. Service. Service. The Bowling Green Police Department is centrally located in the downtown area. Over 160 officers and civilians keep our department working on a daily basis. As Bowling Green Police Officers, we strive to administer the law in a fair and equitable manner. We strive to serve our community and establish programs that allow officers to engage with residents outside of law enforcement. Our police force is comprised of numerous divisions, but together we are one team working towards a common goal, keeping our city safe. Each division plays an invaluable role and first impressions are important. Our records and evidence divisions are tasked with maintaining digital and physical police records and reports. As well as the day-to-day -day functions to ensure our policies and procedures are upheld. Dispatch works as the command center of the police department by gathering and processing calls and information. 911, what is your emergency? Here at Bowling Green Police, we take all the 911 calls in Warren County. And then we take that information and relate it to our officers, to the sheriff's department, to the state police and to the ambulance service, and at the same time trying to keep the callers just as calm as possible. Patrol units are assigned to a specific district to engage in community policing. They respond to emergencies in that district and are responsible for enforcing motor vehicle and criminal laws. As a detective, we receive specialized training to join the Criminal Investigations Division. A detective's primary focus is to uncover the facts to solve complex criminal cases. As Bowling Green's population continues to grow, so does the need for more Bowling Green police officers. We are actively looking for qualified, motivated, and professional men and women to join our team. We are looking for compassionate individuals 
that want to make a difference in their community. Individuals with courage, integrity, honesty, and respect. Individuals who are in top physical condition. You must first complete the hiring process. You will attend our basic training academy in Richmond, Kentucky at the Department of Criminal Justice. After graduation, you'll complete our in-house police officer training program. After completion of the program, you'll be ready for solo patrol. Once you become a Bowling Green police officer, there are opportunities to join a variety of special assignments, such as our critical response team who receives advanced training for high-risk operations, our bike or motor patrol, canine unit, honor guard, or crime scene processors. At the Bowling Green Police Department, we strive to stay up to date with the highest procedures, training, and technology. Our unmanned aircraft team deploys drones in situations where we need an eye in the sky. When I realized that I wanted to be a police officer, I knew that I wanted to be one in the city that I'd lived in the entirety of my life. And I love Bowling Green, so I knew it was gonna be a great opportunity when I decided that I wanted to work for the department. The quality of people that Bowling Green seeks out is, is extremely high as well. Uh, Bowling Green always says that they hire for character and train for skill. And so to me that was very attractive that this department really values people of great character but also that they'll train you well to, to be able to do the job. If somebody's thinking about applying, um, if they have some type of desire to do law enforcement, I, I don't think of a better place that they could put into work. Um, for many reasons, but ultimately you get to work with some of the best people. Uh, and I think that is because of the, the high quality of people that Bowling Green seeks out. If you're up for the challenge and you want to make a difference. If you think you have what it takes to become part of our team. We are the Bowling Green Police Department. We want to hear from you. So I'd like to thank Chief Hawkins and everyone that uh, worked on that. That was all done in-house, so I think that was a well, well done job. Uh, my second item tonight is there will be a need for a closed session, and uh, Ashley will read the reasons. Pursuant to KRS 61810-1B, for the purpose of discussion about the sale of real property by the city, as publicity would likely affect the value of the specific piece of property to be sold, and C, for discussion of pending litigation against the city. Moved. Second. Motion by Nash, second by Denning. Any discussion? Please call the roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Denning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. That all you have, Mr. Meisel, for your comments? That's it. All right, first item is approval of minutes for three different sessions. Our regular meeting on January 15th, 2019, a special meeting on January 25th, 2019, and then our special work session, strategic goal planning session on that same day. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Are there any additions or corrections? Please call the roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Denning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Second reading of Ordinance BG 2019-1. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning attractive land containing 0.11 acre from RM4 multifamily residential to OPC office professional commercial located at 640 East 3rd Avenue, presently owned by Gilbert Barbie Moore and McElvoy, PSC, doing business as Graves Gilbert Clinic. Second. Uh, Nash, second by Dan. This is a second reading of a recommendation that came from a unanimous vote at Planning Commission. Are there any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-10. Municipal Order approving the promotions of Brad Akins to the position of Company Commander and Brian Kozak to the position of Fire Apparatus Operator in the Fire Department. So moved. Second by Denning, Mr. Meisel. With the retirement of uh, Captain Michael Alexander, also known as Big Country, I don't know if he's here tonight, <laughs> but uh, that opens up uh, two promotion opportunities. I'd like to ask Chief Colson to come up and present his recommendations. Oh, what you parked in front of the firehouse this afternoon, too. I have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, with, uh, with, the, with the person with the name of Big Country leaving, uh, I think we lost a great storyteller. So, <clears throat> uh, With that, it's my pleasure to be here this evening to present recommendations for promotion uh, to you all for company commander and fire apparatus operator. 
Uh, promotional testing for these uh, positions was completed a few months back and we had eight members uh, complete the process for company commander and 15 members complete the process for fire apparatus operator. Uh, as you um, are probably aware, promotional testing consists of a written exam and assessments of the member's performance uh, while conducting various tasks related to the positions uh, which they are pursuing. Uh, based on the results of those uh, promotional tests as well as their performance throughout their, uh, the course of their careers with the department, uh, I'm pleased to recommend uh, both Brad Akins and uh, Brian Kozak for promotion. I'd like to share just a brief bio of uh, both of the both of our members and recognize a few of their accomplishments. If I can get Brad to stand, please. Uh, Brad's originally from Indiana. He moved to uh, Bowling Green as a as a as a youngster. Uh, he graduated uh, Warren East High School. Uh, he served in the United States Navy for uh, four years and worked uh, was working as a manager of an outdoor power equipment store uh, when he was hired by the Bowling Green Fire Department in 2006, which gives him. Uh, obviously 12 years with the department. He has been serving as a fire apparatus operator since 2014. Uh, Brad has numerous uh, certifications and has completed uh, quite a bit of training during his tenure. He is a certified EMT. He is a state certified fire instructor. He has uh, completed the f uh, state fire marshals course for fire inspector and uh, he has completed his certification as a fire officer. Uh, he is a member of the department's technical rescue team and also is a hazmat technician. Uh, Brad has been a part of the department's honor guard since 2007 and he has uh, done a tremendous job uh, serving as the coordinator of that program since 2013. Uh, Brad's promotion uh, will create an opening for fire apparatus operator and I'm pleased to recommend Brian Kozak for that position. I'll have Brian stand please. Uh, Brian's originally from California. He too moved here as a, as a child. I think his grandparents retired and moved here. And while his parents were visiting from California, they decided they liked it here as well. So, uh, so uh, Brian landed here around 12 years old. He too graduated from Warren East High School. Warren East has uh, done pretty good tonight, it looks like. Um, sorry, Joe. I didn't mean to offend you. So, um, What's happening here? <laughs> um, but uh, after graduation, as Brian uh, likes to put it, he went straight to the farm. Uh, uh, Brian, if you don't know Brian, he uh, farms a couple thousand acres and has uh, nearly a thousand heads of uh, beef cattle. So he's, uh, he's uh, uh, quite, uh, quite busy. Uh, he's hired by the Bowling Green Fire Department in 2012, giving him now six years with the department. Uh, Brian also holds several certifications that are vital to the operations of our department, including he is uh, an EMT, also a fire inspector, a state instructor, hazmat technician, and has completed his certification as a driver operator for both our, our pumpers and our aerials. Uh, recently, Brian was a valuable member of the apparatus committee responsible for designing and creating specifications for the, for the fire trucks we recently received, and Mayor, I believe he is the one that picked the colors. Pick black, um, I got you. I got so, you. So. Um, <laughs> but all, all joking aside, both of these members are very knowledgeable, hardworking, very motivated, and uh, have demonstrated a high level of engagement within our organization. And with that, it's certainly my pleasure to recommend both of them uh, for promotion. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. So. Comments or questions for Chief Colson? Or the two gentlemen back there? Hearing none, please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Dinning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. Appreciate it. Thank you for your hard work. We know you got a lot more to do. And uh, those of you who came to be here for that, please feel free to slip out because I'm a big crowd of you. Next item is Municipal Order 2019, number 11. Municipal order approving the probationary appointments of Wesley Kirby to the position of Landscape Gardener Golf Division and Tyler Reynolds to the position of Landscape Gardener Landscape Division in the Parks and Recreation Department. So moved. Second. Origin, second by Nash, Mr. Meisel. We have uh, these two positions available due to a promotion and re resignation in our, uh, both in our golf and our landscape divisions. I'd like to ask Aaron Holsey, our HR director, to come up and make the recommendations. Good afternoon. 
Um, as Jeff mentioned, we um, had an opening for a landscape gardener in the golf division. And while we were recruiting for that position, um, we happened to have a resignation in the landscape. So we decided to go ahead and, and use the same pool of candidates for um, the position that it carries the same title. Um, so we publicly advertised. We received 18 applications. 14 were passed on to the Parks Department for review. Seven candidates were selected for an interview, but two decided to remove themselves from the process. And so we uh, interviewed five candidates. The panel was uh, Mike Mitchum, Gabe Nealon, Brent Belcher from Parks, and Tiger Tooley from Human Resources. So I would like to recommend for appointment Wesley Kirby. If you'd like to stand, Wesley. Um, he is being recommended for the position in the golf department. He has worked for the past two years with the local Bowling Green Mowing Companies, A Cut in Time, and Southern Touch. Wesley's well-versed and has a multitude of hands-on experience related to daily landscaping techniques and needs. Furthermore, Wesley holds the required Kentucky State Pesticide Applicators License for this position. Tyler Reynolds is being recommended for the appointment in the Landscape Division. I'd like to stand, Tyler. Um, Tyler actually worked in this division as a part-timer this past summer. And um, so when, the, when he was applying for the position in the Gulf Division, which, which he would have accepted, um, it turns out that he was pretty excited about the opportunity to work with Jay in the Landscape Division again, and, and Jay was happy to have him on. Tyler graduated from Western in May of 2018 with a bachelor degree in biology. Brent and I are very excited about the opportunity to add both of these candidates to our full-time staff. Do you have any questions? Comments or questions for Ms. Delaro? Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Dinning? Yes. Wilkerson? Congratulations to them. Hope you like working. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next is Municipal Order 2019-12. Municipal order accepting and adopting the City of Bowling Green Police Promotional Procedures. So moved. So moved. Sorry. By Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Over the years, we've had uh, this uh, promotional testing process or procedure uh, policy combined between fire and police. We have decided that it would be best to separate those, and so uh, the police department has been working. Uh, Chief Hawkins, uh, Deputy Chief Delaney, and Deputy Chief Bowles have been working with uh, Aaron and HR on this uh, revised policy. Uh, and I'm going to let Aaron step back up and kind of give you a brief overview of what this looks like um, and let, you answer, let her answer any questions you might have on it. <coughs> um, as you received in your paperwork, I, I have the new procedures that is going to be implemented. And, and basically what we're doing here is taking a procedure that had for each section, it had, well, this applies to fire, and then this <coughs> applies to police. And then we go to the next section and it say, okay, well, these are the rules for police and these are the rules for fire. Um, and you know, these, these departments are continuing to really look at their process, making sure that it's um, the right fit for them. And so it made sense at this time to just kind of separate them. We even do them at different times throughout the year. So the month of February, we're going to kick off the application process for the police department and the fire department will happen later in um, late summer and fall. So we went ahead and we wanted to get together police. Um, I, I have a list of changes that are in here. Um, what you're going to find is that a lot of them are really just kind of um, updating some some verbiage to make it for the police only there were some things in there that we we had allowed but maybe it was for the fire department and it wasn't applicable to the police department um, so those are some of the changes um, that we made if you have any questions comments or questions from Ms. Holsey regarding policy yes, I have a few questions uh, so in this procedure, it talks about having a written test as part of the promotional um, process. And I know a few years back, we had removed the written test in regards to our um, hiring process for police because it was found to have a discriminatory impact. And so I'm just curious if we have any da data that shows um, that, you know, does this written test for promotional uh, purposes um, have the, does it also possibly have a discriminatory effect, or do we have data to back up that this is a different test? Can, before, you, before you get saying, the, um, the investigation the Department of Justice did did not find that it had a discriminatory effect. We decided to remove that 
process so that it would not be considered as part of uh, perhaps it may in some future event but we it wasn't any determination like that found um, so it, it's a good question and we hear written test and then we hear written test again and we did away with one um, so the, the prior written test that was used um, that, that we no longer do for recruitment was um, basic knowledge stuff, some math, um, reading, vocabulary, looking at some charts. Um, th there was, you know, a, a scene of maybe a, a possible criminal scene answering a couple questions about that, but, but nothing that required any knowledge whatsoever of law enforcement. Um, and we've decided that to not do that for recruitment. The written test that we do for the promotional process is very relevant to um, the police department, to law enforcement, um, the each position and rank that people are testing for, they get a list, a reading list, um, which, um, you know, some of the names of the book are supervision of police personnel, community and problem-oriented policing, um, uh, reputable conduct, ethical issues, and policing and corrections. So you can hear based on the titles of these books on the reading list that, that it's subject matter and it's very relevant to their position. And if they don't do well on the written test, um, then, then perhaps they're not a good candidate for promotion at that time. Um, and that written test is only 50% of the entire promotional scores. Another 50% is the assessment centers, um, which is they're tested on, on other related activities versus a test. Um, in the promotional process. Um, I did pull some basic numbers. Um, in, in the sworn members of the police department, we have 11% minorities, and actually in our management, sworn management positions, we're at 19% of minorities. Um, so that would kind of indicate is that, that this test is, is doing a good job and a fair job of assessing the members of the police department for promotion. Thank you for answering my question. I have one more. Mm -hmm. um, the latter part references removing um, the language around a grievance procedure uh, because we don't have an administrative appeals board anymore. And so I'm just curious about, you know, if so if they do uh, want to appeal the decision of being passed over for a promotion, uh, what would a police officer do at this time without an administrative appeals board? So we're, we're working on an update to the policies and procedures manual um, since the Administrative Appeals Board has been removed. Um, and right now the proposal would be the department head, which in this case probably would not be applicable because it's the department head who's making the decision. Um, that person would be able to appeal the decision to me as the Director of Human Resources. Um, I would complete an investigation of the process. Um, and then they would also have the ability to appeal a decision to the city manager. Thank you. I have a couple questions. Uh, section 54-A, uh, it talks about makeup exceptions, uh, and the only exceptions that are allowed are military leave and emergency medical leave. Is it possible to include, or was it considered and denied about somebody who had, uh, I don't vacation, but other people do, and they book vacations in advance? not knowing when the testing procedure is going to be announced, or are those announced a year in advance? We don't announce it a year in advance, but the schedule already is set for police and fire for 2019, and it's the exact same schedule that was in place last year. So, so they do follow a pattern of, for example, assessment centers for police is always the week before Memorial Day. And for, for fire written testing, it's the week after, and then there's, there's so many weeks in between. So they have a general understanding of when the promotional process is. Um, in the police department, as you'll see, they have the ability to carry over their scores a year. So if they got a really good score, they feel very confident about it. Um, they were on the list the prior year, but were not promoted. They can carry over their score instead of testing again. Um, one of the reasons that this is in place um, for the written test is because they have the written test, they go in, I, I sit and I observe with so that um, our uh, representative from, from resource management associates is sometimes they go out in the hall to actually test. They test immediately there, they, they finish the exam and then they, he goes and he scores it. He brings his Scantron machine, he goes out in the hall and he scores it. When everybody has completed the test, they have the ability at that time to appeal or challenge any questions. 
So if we were to have multiple days for testing, we wouldn't be able to do that challenge process. Um, Steve Hale from RMA is the subject matter expert on the exams. He knows exactly which books to go to, what resource it was pulled from. So having him there in that moment to engage in any challenges that come up is really important. So that's why we would really want to limit any time we would want to do a makeup session. And you know, in discussion with the deputy chiefs and the chiefs, we kind of thought that these two reasons might be th the only reason that someone might be signed up and, and then miss it. So someone is called on military um, you know, duty, they have something they need to go for. Um, we could even perhaps have it proctored there at the same time and the same date. That would be an option we would look at. And a medical emergency might come up and, and, and we don't want to completely take away the opportunity for a person to test to promote in the rare occasion that something like that might happen. I, I agree with you because I'm looking for less limitations that that they might not test rather than more. And I want to make sure I understand the answer to your question, and that is if I were if I were a police officer and booking a vacation on February the 5th, I know when the testing procedure is for the next year so that I can comfortably book that and not worry that it's going to fall in the middle of fall break. You're, you're going to have a really good idea of the time of the year that the, the testing is going to happen. If not the exact dates, probably within a week or two. Um, there, there's no discussion right now of changing the timing of when we do the testing. And that's in 2019. Can I assume that's going to be true in 20 and 21 and 28 and 37? Or like I said, we, we haven't specifically discussed the dates or set the schedule for next year, um, but we have discussed the fact that the schedule works right now. Uh, I think been that way since the 80s. When, when it was so there the you go. <laughs> yeah. So maybe no. we can count another 30 years out at least for those, yeah. way, those beach vacations. And, and, and just be, and, and, and I know we're joking around, but just because it's been that way since the 80s doesn't mean we need to continue it for another 100 years. Uh, I think you answered my second question, and that is that scores can be carried over, and that's at the choice of the officer who's testing. They do have to designate at the time of the application that they are carrying over their score. And they have to carry over their entire score. They cannot carry over the written but redo assessment centers. Um, it's either all or nothing. And my final question it references section 6-1-A. Why would we move away from a public listing to where only a limited number of people know how people did and, and, and who's promoting and why? Promotional testing is fiercely competitive. Um, and so the reason for taking away that the public posting of this, they are, they're, they're going to probably within the halls and within their group, they're, they're probably gonna match up where they are. Um, there, there have been a couple instances throughout the year where we think probably having it not as a public list, which was always anonymous, by the way. We never posted a list with names. Right. So it was always you know, an employee ID or something like that. In the 80s, evidently. <laughs> they, they posted with names? Names, social security numbers, dates of birth. <laughs> so, so at some point they changed over to a, a, a number, um, and, and this was something that I discussed with the city manager as well as the chiefs, um, that um, it's probably not going to make it less competitive, um, but a couple of the concerns that we had, may, maybe this would um, help to um, dismiss some of those. And are you able to, to, to address what those concerns are publicly? I'll refer to Jeff, perhaps, on some of those. Some of those are um, current investigations are, are still happening with some of those concerns. Um, and Jeff or Jean, I guess you could speak on whether or not. I, I, I would rather not. I can talk to you privately. It's involving personnel, so. Okay understands personnel Gene, questions. You. That's why I ask if we were able to discuss it here. What I'm really just driving at is I, I, I like as much transparency as we can build into the system as possible. And if everybody who tested knows everybody's score, even if they, as you said, don't know the name, there is no argument later that favoritism came into play in the promotion 
because the score was posted and everybody knows what it is. That's that's what we're looking at making improvements to. So that we're it's it's still in process. I guess you'd say that's why I don't feel like I have, I have enough to to speak on tonight because there's nothing that's been completed and decided. But we are working on improvements to that process. Fair Is that fair? Yes. I think that's one of the reasons that the HR office is the one who um, is, is ultimately responsible for the entire promotional testing for both police and fire. Um, you know, I'm in charge of who applies and um, I oversee the, the written tests and go to the assessment centers and schedule them. Um, all of the scores come back to the HR department and then, you know, I forward them on to the police chief and the fire chief um, and I hold all of those records if there were any concerns. Great. Thank you. Other questions? Anything else? Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Dinning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, Municipal Order 2019-13. Municipal Order authorizing renewal of bid number 2017-37 for uniforms for the police department from CMS Uniforms and Equipment Company Incorporated of Nashville, Tennessee, Gulls LLC of Lexington, Kentucky, and Nats Outdoor Sports of Bowling Green, Kentucky. So moved. Second. Okay. Perigen, second by Nash, Mr. Mosel. We bid all of this out in 2017, and we did a an option to renew for two additional years, and so this would be the second year that we are choosing to renew uh, with the same pricing. We've got letters from each of these companies uh, that have agreed to keep the pricing the same. Therefore, we are recommending to go ahead and and take advantage of that last year of extension on the on these. Uh, these, these contracts. I'd be glad to try to answer any questions or uh, Chief Hawkins is here too, but we're basically keeping everything the same, same pricing. I'll answer questions. Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? I stepped move. out. Said move on. <laughs> Wilkerson? Yes, Municipal Order 2019-14. Municipal order authorizing accepting bid number 2019-35 for a microfilming project from Data Records Management Services, LLC, of Paducah, Kentucky, in the amount of $126,879. Moved. Second. Nash second by Perigen, Mr. Meisel. As you know, we uh, developed a records retention facility a couple years back, and we are trying to get caught up on our, our records uh, we have hundreds of boxes of paper that we would like to convert to microfilm, uh, electronic, for that are permanent records that we have to maintain in perpetuity. And so we went out for bid. We've got one bid here from Data Records Management Services uh, for $126,000, but we do have another item coming up that involves a grant uh, that will offset this contract and help pay for it. So we are recommending to go ahead and accept this contract with Data Records Management Services uh, to, to try to complete approximately, um, it'll, be, it'll make a big dent in it, let's say, say, to say the least, but we've got, as I mentioned, uh, lots and lots of boxes in the facility that we would like to get converted over. Uh, you can have a fire, a lot of things can happen that these are permanent records we've got to get uh, converted over and this this contract would help us make a big dent in that and we'll cover the the revenue side of it here in just a second comments or questions all roll ash yes perigen yes beasley brown yes wilkerson yes municipal order 2019-15 Municipal order authorizing accepting negotiations after sealed bidding for bid number 2019-39 for renovations of Lampkin Park Asphalt Court from Vestias uh, Sports Fields Incorporated of Lexington, Kentucky in the amount of $347,880. So moved. Second. Urgent second by Nash, Mr. Meisel. This is a project that you all approved as part of the FY19 budget as a capital uh, project over in Lampkin Park. As you know, we, we've done a lot to, to Lampkin Park in the last year or two with the spray ground, the, the cool playground with the, um, the uh, zip line feature on it. Uh, 
It'll with carry the trails, Brent, Brent, NCS has helped with some of the, the trails that connect to the park. And so I don't know if you all looked at these pictures of this, this asphalt court, but it's, it's in very, very bad shape. It has not been touched since 1989, according to Brent Belcher. And so we went out for bid on this to see what we could get done. We, we looked at uh, an artificial turf surface for uh, futsal, and they came in at a, at a price we really didn't like that well at 417. And so we went back into negotiations with them, and we've come back with a price of 347, 880. Uh, we think this is a good price given the fact of uh, all of the work, the removal of the asphalt. Uh, we're going to deposit it uh, on site at Lampkin Park uh, to, to, to discard it, and then we're going to put topsoil and grass over the top of that which will also help another area of the park that's, that's kind of in, in, in poor condition, uh, leveling it out, making it a nice green space. And so we're gonna come to you tonight with this proposal. Uh, this is really close to the Limestone Springs spray ground, and we're proposing to put 170 by 240 foot uh, area of uh, artificial turf in that can be used year round for soccer, uh, even uh, in some cases, uh, Pee Wee and Coach Pitch and T-Ball when it's uh, bad conditions to get on a, a baseball field. So it, it can be used for multiple purposes. So uh, we recommend this uh, bid of the 347-880 from Vesio Sports Fields to, to renovate this, this area over in Lampkin Park. And um, Brent's here to answer any questions or to fill in any more details for you. But uh, hopefully you got the colored pictures in your packets to, to see the condition of this existing surface. It's, it's very bad. Uh, we're also working on um, Parker Bennett as well. Uh, Parker Bennett is another uh, piece that's in our current year budget that we'll be uh, probably bringing to you before too long too to resurface. So, but this one, we're converting it from asphalt to this turf type um, surface. Can I ask a question? Two yes, questions, actually. What's the life of this type of, of asphalt? Is, is, it, is it longer than concrete? They approximate uh, around 10 years okay. uh, for most of it. Now, Division I Westerns was more like five years because it's competitive play. This is uh, traditionally, they say, about 10 years. Uh, that goes into, uh, you have preventive maintenance. Uh, you have to do some uh, regular routine things. Of course, you're not cutting it, but you have to uh, take, take some things to, to ensure that. Uh, so yeah, about 10 years. Okay. You might speak of the recreational use and volume that this, these, these type areas get. Well, as, as Mr. Meisel mentioned, the great thing about it is you can't have overuse on a turf field. Uh, so, uh, uh, it is my opinion by, by adding this at Lampkin Park, we're actually assisting our soccer fields throughout the entire community because we'll have a place for the entire community to play regardless of the weather. Uh, there, so uh, that's, that's the big benefit to us uh, as we're constantly searching of ways to meet the demand for our community's uh, soccer desire. Uh, this would go a long ways to at least help us. Uh, uh, so. Uh, uh, that's the great thing and of course turf is as Jeff mentioned we can do a lot of other things uh, anything sports related you can do that whether it's uh, you know any type of, 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 of activity that you'd like to do we can we could do that on that whether it's uh, youth baseball t-ball that sort of things uh, uh, adult flag football uh, that sort of stuff so. I think it's great that we're working on Lampkin Park it just it warms yeah. my heart to see it right. what's your timeline uh, it will follow uh, as Jeff mentioned uh, it's just it it's actually going to follow the, the asphalt plant type of thing. So uh, this would be, uh, uh, we don't have them on contract, but my guess is sometime in the midsummer. Uh, the, the warmer, the better for this type of project. Uh, Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Dinning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, Municipal Order 2019-16. Municipal order approving recommendation from the Bowling Green Area Convention and Visitors Bureau to distribute $152,354 of transient room taxes to the National Corvette Museum. So moved. 
And I second by Perigen. Mr. Mazel. I'm going to hand this one off to Sherry Murphy, our new director out at CVB, uh, to present this to you. Hi. <laughs> Thank you all for allowing me to come before you again tonight. As you can see in the memo, uh, we are putting forth this recommendation. Um, I'm not sure that Commissioner Beasley Brown knows. This is money that is the hotel tax that is set aside for special tourism projects and uh, uh, nonprofit associations or attractions can come and ask for funds to help with projects and things that, that they would like to see happen. And then we get to judge at the CBB if they are um, tourism worthy that they would bring overnights to, into the community and also help with economic impact to, a, to the area. Um, so I'm just here to answer any questions you all may have about um, our recommendation and then we also have Katie uh, here from the uh, museum to answer any specific questions about the project. Questions for me? I think it's going to be great. I, I think really it's going to be a really cool addition. Plus, yeah. it's a really slow time of the year for us, so we're hoping that will help boost our numbers. Yeah. Right. Right. I guess it's a marketing effort because it brings people from all over the place into the community and even off the interstate. It, it's a professional display. I thank Miss Katie for being here and short timer, Mr. Strode. <laughs> thank you for being here too. Any other Please. questions? Please call the roll. Ash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-17. Municipal Order authorizing the acceptance of a grant from the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives through the Kentucky Local Records Program in the amount of $50,685. Motion by Nash, second by Denning. Mr. Mazel. This is uh, the other item that I mentioned earlier. It goes with item six. This is the uh, the grant that we will use to offset the cost for the the microfilming. I'd like to thank uh, Nick Cook for working on this grant from the Kentucky Department for Libraries and Archives, and we're going to get uh, fifty thousand six eighty five to put against that one twenty six eight seventy nine, which will will uh, will make a, a good offset to that expense. So. Um, uh, entertain any questions you have on this one too. I'm your questions. I'll roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Denning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order 2019-18. Municipal Order authorizing and approving the amended and restated Exterior Property Improvement Program Agreement between the City of Bowling Green and Live the Dream Development Incorporated for the Census Tract 112 Exterior Property Improvements Program in the amount of $250,000. So moved. Second. Motion by Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Miles. So, um, so we've been working on Census Tract 112 with the Neighborhood Improvements Program and we did a, uh, a contract with Live the Dream for 500,000. They have virtually completed the first $250,000 of that contract. They've got maybe three or four more houses to serve with the, with the, with the remaining funds, but they are requesting the next $250,000 that would be used to uh, go towards another 42 properties in that census track. And uh, along with that, there's an $800 uh, per property uh, admin fee that we would uh, pay them to, to um, s oversee this program. Uh, this gets a lot done and helps NCS with this uh, neighborhood improvements program. Um, and so we are asking for approval. The again, landlords and businesses businesses may receive up to five thousand dollars with a twenty percent required contribution for landlords. And then it's a 50% uh, contribution required for businesses in, in, for this program. And Brent's here, uh, can answer any questions and fill in any more details. Do you have anything else, Brent? So this is just kind of the second part of that contract we, we did with Live the Dream for Census Track 112. Speaker, are you running this program, Link? Good job. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Any other comments? Please call the roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen. 
Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Denning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes. Municipal Order 2019-19. Municipal order approving and authorizing execution of an agreement with the Commonwealth of Kentucky Department of Housing, Buildings, and Construction related to the granting of additional responsibility for building and electrical permits, plan review, inspections, and enforcement. I move. Second. Motion by Perrigan, second by Denny. Ms. Miley. This item is, um, this is an extension or kind of a renewal uh, for our building and uh, inspection divisions to continue <clears throat> doing the inspections for the state. Uh, we've been doing this on behalf of the state since 1980, I believe. And uh, we complete these inspections and these are your routine ones. The state still maintains or retains inspection uh, rights to uh, certain type projects like the institutional buildings, educational buildings, and the bigger projects, but Brent's division uh, building and electrical uh, will continue to provide uh, inspections and plan reviews on uh, everything else that the, the state would ever otherwise do. So um, Brent's here that can answer any further questions you have on this item, uh, but we are recommending we go ahead and renew again uh, this agreement with the state to, to continue with these inspections. Comments or questions? Call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perrigan? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. First reading of ordinance BG 2019 number two. Ordinance rezoning real estate. Ordinance rezoning <clears throat> tracts of land containing 39.71 acres from RS1A single family residential, RM4 multifamily residential, GB general business and HB highway business to highway business located at zero Campbell Lane, presently owned by Bell of Kentucky Family Limited Partnership with Menards Incorporated as contract vendee. Second. Motion by Denning, second by Perigen. This is a Unanimous recommendation from planning and zoning on first reading. Are there any comments or questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Ben, I believe you're up. Ben, it is my understanding that there was a fence that is supposed to be or was committed to that would be at the back that would separate this particular development from the Eastland Park subdivision. That's correct. Is that in this document? That, is, that was committed to uh, at the public hearing, and it is part of the development plan condition, so yes. Can you show me where that is in this document? May I see what document yeah. you have to be sure of? That's the right one. It's in the oral comments. It's Thank you. Never mind, 12 back. The, con the concept plan that you have in, in that packet there does not show the fence uh, because they were originally proposed at the time was a landscape, 50 foot landscape berm. Uh, through the, uh, the, the process, uh, the applicant agreed to the fence uh, uh, after, uh, at the behest of, of the neighbors. So, that concept plan does not show it, but the development plan con conditions do have it uh, uh, correctly worded to have the, uh, the fence uh, and, and calls that fence out. And I will uh, say I, I do have an updated uh, plan that was submitted by Menards, which I have permission to share uh, preliminarily for the development review process, which is kind of the site plan, which is the next step. And it does show a 50-foot landscape buffer with the fence uh, on the inside, the Menard side of that as well. So we, that, that has been committed to. So with this being in the development plan conditions, there is no chance whatsoever that this fence won't be built, or if it's not built, that there's not remedy for that. Correct, but not unless there is another proposal with another public hearing that changes that. Uh, okay. You know, things change over time, but Fair you, enough. you are yes. correct. Okay. No further questions. I have a question. Uh, so looking back over the public hearing on this, I, um, they did have first proposed a 50-foot uh, 
buffer with a berm, and then it was replaced by the fence. Um, and it was a little bit confusing because we talked a little bit about, um, you know, wanting to make sure it was similar to what the neighborhood understood uh, the conditions were in terms of Myers or Gary Farms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I didn't see in the development plan conditions that it specified that with the fence that there would also be remain a 50 foot buffer. So I just wanted to ask if that remains. You are, you are correct. So that, um, uh, and I re-reviewed the, the public hearing uh, uh, video before, before tonight's meeting. So uh, the request was for the fence. So the applicant removed the 50 foot landscape berm and replace that with the fence and then meeting the uh, zone, uh, the uh, landscaping requirements outlined in the zoning ordinance. The zoning ordinance only uh, requires a 10 foot buffer uh, with, uh, with associated landscaping. Uh, and then of course they've, they've agreed to the fence as well. Uh, but uh, it's, it's my understanding and we do have a representative uh, uh, from Menards here if you wish to hear from them. But it, and, and with this submission that, uh, that we uh, received last week for the development review process, they are still going to, uh, at this time, plan on doing the 50-foot um, the fifty foot landscape buffer, no berm, but then also still have that fence. So um, that, that is our understanding at this time. But you are correct, as the development plan conditions are written, they are not required to do, to do that. It would just be the 10-foot. So may I ask if there would be any reason why uh, they might change their mind in terms of a 50-foot buffer? Uh, you might uh, might have to ask them that. Um, I don't don't know of any reason why, but I can't obviously speak for Menards. Uh, may I ask if you think? I mean, is this something you think that might change, or is this part of your development plans? Uh, th this is part of our development plans. Um, we want to be as close to the Campbell Lane frontage as possible. That's where all the traffic coming into the site is going to be. Um, on the most recent site plan that we've submitted to, to staff for review, we're still showing that 50-foot buffer and then the fence on the inside of that. So that's still part of our plans. And then I just have one more question. I'm not sure it's for you or for Ben, but um, so this fence, does it connect to the Myers fence when it's built? So um, n no, ev and eventually. So the reason is, the answer is no, is because there is another property between Myers and uh, the property Menard zone, and that back corner, there's an offset. So. Obviously, we can't require Men Menards to install the fence on someone else's property. So that intervening property uh, is there, and so we, th there will not be that connection. But they will be required to uh, install the fence the whole length of that Eastland subdivision. And where the fence is proposed to be located, will once that vacant land d does get developed, will that location of the fence be at the appropriate location to then connect to the Myers fence at that time, if that's what happens. Yeah, so once that uh, is part of Gary Farms binding elements or development plan conditions, uh, once that property develops, they will be required to connect that same fence and it will have to connect up. So there will be the continuous fence barrier. Thank you. You're welcome. Comments or questions? Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Dinning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, Municipal Order 2019-20. Municipal Order approving an amendment to the Job Development Incentive Program Employee Withholdings Credit Agreement with Cabelco Aluminum Products at Extrusions Incorporated. Second. Motion by Dinning, second by Nash. Mr. Meisel. Ask Katie to uh, give you an overview of this amendment we're making to this uh, incentive we did for Cabelco. Board of Commissioners previously approved a job development incentive agreement with Cobalco Aluminum Products Excursion, Extrusions Incorporated in October of 2016 uh, under the Kentucky Business Investment Program. And that program requires a 1% match from the city to the state's 3% match uh, that's provided. And it's over a 10 year period. So under that previous agreement, or current agreement, Cabelco estimated to create up to 105 jobs in conjunction with its new facility located in Bowling Green. That facility would then generate new payroll over that 10-year period of the program, totaling over $73 million. 
In late 2018, the city was notified that Cobalco requested modifications to the original agreement, which the JDIP committee did recently um, hear about, I think back in November. Um, and so with the modified agreement, they now estimate the creation of 220 new jobs, generating approximately 152 million in new payroll over the 10-year period, and then capital investment estimated over 95.2 million. The, city, the city's revised 1% withholding credit is estimated to be worth over 1.5 million to the company over the 10-year period, and then the city's share would be 1.3 million over the same period. Thank you, Anika. Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-21. Municipal Order Accepting and Adopting the City of Bowling Green Records Retention Policies and Procedures Manual. So moved. Second. Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Mosel? Continuing with our records retention theme here tonight, and uh, since we've got the grant now to microfilm, we built the facility back a couple year, years ago when we renovated the annex. We hired a records management coordinator. We feel there is a need to go ahead and have a records retention policies and procedures manual. So we have put that together for you tonight. This is the first, first one out of the box. And I'm sure uh, there could be amendments to it, revisions to it over the coming years. But this is what we, uh, Ashley has put together and, and Jen and I have reviewed it and feel like this is a good start as far as responsibilities for what the departments are responsible for, uh, record storage procedures, all those kind of things. And so uh, we would like to get your approval of this tonight. I'll answer questions. <coughs> Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Order 2019-22. Municipal order approving construction and accepting maintenance of Nathan's Rim Way in the Berthus Rim subdivision. So moved. Second. Second by now. This is um, just an acceptance of a subdivision. Um, this is Berthus Rim. Um, Planning and zoning has done their final inspection and are ready to uh, propose that we take this over. Uh, Greg is here to answer any questions you may have on this one. I think they have gone out and inspected it and done their protocol with it, and so it's ready to accept under your approval. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I normally drive out to these properties and look at them, but I was not able to get to this particular piece of property because of my own schedule. Uh, but looking at Google Maps on it is, and I don't know how recent that picture is, as Nathan Rim, Nathan's Rim goes away from industrial, it on, on Google it turns into a dirt road. Is that still the case? It does, in fact, and, and that's a, a, a retention area, a flood area. So. There is a dirt road where some excavation has taken place, some some construction debris has been, That's what has I'm been put in there, and it's it's not landfill type stuff, so it's construction debris, uh, and it does connect to the cul-de-sac that comes off of Nashville Road. Uh, I'm not sure the name of it right now, but it's adjacent to the old mall property there. So right. they do connect, but only through the dirt road. It's it's not going to be a, a formal connection uh, at some point once the construction is done on either end. And will the construction debris be cleaned up, or is that acceptable? Um, it's not. It's not complete yet. It's not acceptable. It's not done. Uh, but obviously, they there's, you know, with the Corps of Engineers with the flood zone, they had to apply for a permit to be able to fill that area in. So it is acceptable in terms of the quantity. Uh, it's not finished yet. It's not a finished product yet. No, and it's all owned by the same property owner. So. And, and nothing about the approval of accepting maintenance of the road would affect that particular area eventually being cleaned up when everything is finished? Does not. Great. Thank you. Questions? Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes, Municipal Order 2019-23. 
Municipal order approving construction and accepting maintenance of Cumberland Ridge subdivision section five. I'll move. Second. Urgent second by Nash. Same deal. Uh, P and Z have, have done their final inspection of the uh, this last, uh, I think it's the last section of Cumberland Ridge sub subdivision in the back and are handing it off to us for acceptance. And so again, Greg and Public Works has uh, gone out and approved uh, the acceptance and we ask for your approval on this one too tonight. Cumberland Ridge, phase five. Are there any comments or questions? Please call the roll. Ash. Yes. Perigen. Yes. Beasley Brown. Yes. Denning. Yes. Wilkerson. Yes, Municipal Order 2019-24. Municipal Order consenting to the dissolution of the South Central Kentucky Works Incorporated, a nonprofit, non-stock Kentucky public corporation, and after the payment of any obligations consenting to the distribution of its remaining assets to the Bowling Green Area Chamber Foundation Incorporated. So moved. Perigen. Before there was a South Central Kentucky Workforce Development Board, we were, uh, the chamber and us and the county were trying to put a program together for workforce development. And so uh, the South Central Kentucky Works Inc., a nonprofit uh, corporation was put together back a couple years ago to raise funds for workforce development purposes. Uh, this entity is no longer really uh, um, serves a purpose with the Workforce Development Board now under Robert Boone that is receiving we owe a money from uh, the feds and so uh, this entity this nonprofit um, uh, Southern Kentucky Works Foundation or Incorporation is uh, we are dissolving. I'm actually on this board and we've met. I've only had to go to a couple meetings before uh, this idea came up to dissolve it. And so uh, before you tonight is just to get your approval because the city and county uh, put the seed money into this, um, this, this nonprofit back in 2014, I believe it was, to get it started. So I have with us tonight uh, attorney... Um, Gaines Penn that uh, has worked on this dissolution and can answer any questions you have about it. Comments or questions? Uh, I, sorry, a lot of this happened in terms of moving to this board instead of the using the Brad for workforce development. Um, and so would you mind just telling the story again about the, why we created it and why we're dissolving it and where, where did the money go while it was um, active and and then my last question is, uh, if Robert, you mentioned something about Robert Boone. So is this his, what he receives his Wyoa funds under? Okay. Well, that's a great question. And uh, <laughs> for the sake of brevity, I'll do my best to give you a, a Reader's Digest version of this. But uh, back in 2014, 2015, the federal law changed regarding workforce development. It was called WIA, and then it changed to a new acronym called WIOA, which stands for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act. And during that transition, there was some controversy locally about what our region's workforce development area would look like. And there, was a, there were two, basically, plans proposed, one of which was a smaller, more focused workforce area that consisted of the city, the county, and just the surrounding counties, Logan, Simpson, and Allen, I believe. That was, and then the other plan was basically all of the counties, which are the Brad, basically, Brad area. Um, the new creation of the work, regional workforce area required the governor's consent. The governor went with the other plan. So uh, as we were trying to set up this smaller workforce area, um, we went ahead and created this uh, basically an operating company or an administrative arm, which is this South Central Kentucky Works, Inc., which is supposed to help with marshalling funds and implementing the program. Well, when that regional workforce area did, did not get approved, we had this nice 501c3 corporation sitting there. So we sort of changed the, the goal of it somewhat, and that was to help the city and the county with it, with with workforce development 
uh, issues that they came up from time to time. By and large, the main focus of this nonprofit has been to help with training up the actual workforce investment board that came into being, which is part of the South Central Workforce Development Board, which Mr. Boone oversees. We helped with training with an outside consultant, so forth and so on. Now that they're up and running, they're doing fine. They've got federal funds coming in. Um, and like Jeff said, I sit on that board. We're sitting here going, okay, I think our mission is done. Uh, and so we unanimously approved a resolution to dissolve, but since you all were instrumental in creating this, uh, we went, we're asking your consent to dissolve, and we're asking for the county's consent to dissolve, and they've already granted that. And so the question is, since it's a nonprofit, there's still some money stuck in it, what do you do with it? And so the rules for nonprofits is it has to go to another nonprofit. And the, and the board and our infinite wisdom decided to uh, the best place to stick this money for workforce development efforts going forward would be the Chamber Foundation for a couple of reasons. Number one, this company has basically been overseen by the Chamber staff already. Guess what? The Chamber Foundation staff, it's the same, it, but it's up and running. It's still in good shape. It's been used to help fund things like the Leader in Me program. That's where the money flowed through. I can see this, uh, these funds being earmarked for workforce development. Maybe um, they go to things like the uh, South Central Kentucky Launch Program, which is, again, workforce development at the younger, at the youngest workers in our community. So that's, that's sort of the plan, and that's why we're asking your consent. Okay, and um, the new workforce development board that Robert Boone oversees. For some reason, I thought they had created a special foundation to fund that workforce board, and so I'm confused as to why we're not giving it to that foundation. That would be an option, but it's just the, the one thing we think that was just the discretion of this board to, to put it over here in the foundation. So in order to get it back to the workforce development board under Robert Boone, would it have to be transferred from the is, is that a whole uh, separate process to get it back under Workforce Development Board usage? Yes, ma'am. I mean, it, it would be money that would, um, if there was a need for it to be transferred to that foundation, it certainly could eventually end up there. I, I'm sure that could happen, but it's just right now, I think you have more flexibility if you keep it over in the foundation and the city and county, you know, they say, hey, we want to, we want we think that would be this would be a good use I'm certain the foundation would entertain that I think that I think the chamber foundation though has been the main driver be, be, be behind the SCK launch with Meredith creating that program and so a lot of the chamber foundation monies has have gone to SCK launch which is workforce development in the eighth grade ninth grade to twelfth grade high school age to get that pipeline started. So we felt, as the SCK Works Board felt like that was the probably the, the best place to go with it because it's already where the money's getting spent out of for the for the launch and other things that we're trying to do with, with the, the high school and junior high age kids as far as the career academies and all that kind of stuff. So I guess it would be a matter of the Chamber Foundation making the decision to hand off to the, the other 501 C3 that's under the Workforce Development Board. So that would be kind of out of our jurisdiction, I guess, after we, if we do this here tonight. Well, so. and I'm sorry, I'm still learning how all the different pots of money goes into different workforce stuff. But now that I understand that the, the foundation funds the Sky Launch and all those other workforce activities, I, that makes sense to me. For some reason, I thought they had funneled all the, those through this other foundation. And so I didn't understand the connection, but I understand Seven. now. Right. Yeah, thank you. Your questions? Yes, sir. Uh -huh. uh, what amount of monies are we talking about? It's a good question. I, 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 that didn't even come up. That the, the uh, balance is sixty thousand and like one hundred eighteen dollars, I think, is to be exact. Comments? Please call the roll. Nash. Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Yes. Municipal Order 2019-25. Municipal Order correcting an original KRS 
45 filing related to ordinance number BG 8046 and adopting a modern and accurate legal description of territory previously annexed by ordinance. So moved. Second. By Perigen, second by Nash. Mr. Meisel. This is, uh, I'm, I'm going to go into a little bit longer explanation for Commissioner Beasley Brown's uh, benefit. These are cleanups of and some annexations that we did back in the 80s. The state is is telling us that they did not get uh, the proper legal description or the way they wanted the legal description done. They're kind of peculiar, I guess you'd say, along with a map to show uh, the area. So Public Works has been working on these. Kyle Bearden, uh, bless his heart, and he's been uh, trying to, and, and Rob to working through these, trying to get these cleaned up, submitted to the state, uh, uh, state secretary of state's office to to get the the legal description updated for these annexed areas. This particular one was done back in 1980, uh, and it is the Fieldstone Farms area. So it's just a record keeping cleanup type item for the secretary of state's office. And it does, it does not change the original annexation in any way. Uh, it's, just, it's just clean up for the state's benefit. But the documents that were sent in at that time were the legal documents of record, right? At the time, we sent what was required, and it met requirements at that time, but now they want in it a different format. Is that correct, Ashley? And we are trying to appease them and get that done. Accommodate. And we've got, what, a few more to go, Greg? We have a few more. A few more that have less impact in terms of upcoming expenses. This was our largest area lacking that we, we still have a few more to do. Any assistance from the state, such as money uh, and our staff, all on our own? Do what you got to do. That happens a lot. <laughs> Any other comments? Please call the roll. Nash? Yes. Perigen? Yes. Beasley Brown? Yes. Denning? Yes. Wilkerson? Last item on our agenda, we'll have public comments after a brief five-minute recess. If you have public comments to make, make sure your name's on the list so I know who to call up. Thank you. We'll take a recess.
Welcome back to the meeting and for our public comment section. First up is John Melson. Mr. Melson, please come up. Evening. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a young guy trying to get involved in local politics for the first time. Uh, you may have seen me in here at the previous meeting in January, uh, just trying to feel things out. And I was hoping to just give you my impression, some of my thoughts uh, as I step into this, this world. Um, my first impression is that uh, it is, it's a refreshingly democratic kind of operation. Uh, I feel like I, I see and hear uh, countless examples of ways that our government, local, state, federal, does not meet that uh, criteria, but I feel good about what y'all are doing here. Um, uh, so that's, that's good. Um, but it is kind of cold in here. I don't know. I don't know if anyone feels that way. Uh, maybe we'll work on that. I have felt that before. <laughs> I felt that. <laughs> um, on a more serious note, uh, I think 4:30 is too early to start this thing. Uh, I work. I have about a 45-minute commute. Uh, I get out at 4:30. Seems like a fairly standard, run-of-the-mill kind of schedule and yet much of this meeting is inaccessible to me on that schedule. I would very much like to see that changed. Uh, I think, I don't know, I, I imagine some of y'all have, have tossed this back and forth between each other. I think something like 5.30 or 6 is more reasonable, more accessible, uh, and thus more democratic. I think that's what sh we should be striving for. Um, also, final point going back to something that was discussed at the previous meeting uh, was exactly how we record these public comments uh, I believe we said we we ended on there's a video recording of the whole thing and perhaps there's a written summary of, of the public comments that's that was my takeaway from the previous meeting uh, I would love the opportunity to submit written material. I have nothing before me this time. No need to, uh, to be transcribing. But if someone has something written down that they'd like to submit and thus and therefore upload uh, in some site where it can be keyword searched, I think that would be a fantastic addition to the way y'all are doing this, this, uh, these meetings. Uh, I am very much interested in being able to Google search or control F uh, what members of the community have said about these issues I care about. Um, so I hope that will not fall by the wayside. I hope that will continue to be discussed. Can you repeat that? I didn't, I didn't quite hear what you said. Search by what? Oh, to be able to keyword search, whether in Google or open up a, a document and, and, and try to find particular words that I'm looking for, that I'd like to know what members of my community have said about these topics. Um, we, the public, can do all that work for you. Uh, I think at least one other member in attendance has typed out their statement. So I think a, my, part of my ideal vision of how this will all work includes that, is that ability to directly submit, of course, run it through, run it under y'all's eyes to make sure uh, no profanities and things of that nature and then have it as, as public rec record for everyone to see. Okay? Thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Next up, Paul Carter. Hey guys, I did type out my statement, uh, but it's because I touch on policy and uh, I'm a policy wonk and I get real long-winded. Um, I rise today to discuss inevitability and inasmuch how we as a community face the future. Do we lead, do we follow, or are we dragged behind? We gather today just shy of six years since FICO, Kentucky, population 334, enacted its fairness ordinance. They moved some five months prior to the landmark SCOTUS ruling in United States v. Windsor. Little Vico led. Why are we dragged so far behind? When will Bowling Green find her feet? 
I rise today to discuss inevitability and how we as a community face the future. Our small town is small no longer, though you couldn't tell it by the way we smile at strangers, by the way we care about our neighbors. Our status as a city approaching a metropolis is made abundantly apparent, however, when examining issues of poverty and homelessness. Here, we have the opportunity to follow. Since adopting a housing first approach to homelessness in 2005, Utah has seen a 91% reduction in chronic homelessness. Finland adopted a similar approach in 2008 expanding the definition of homelessness to include people who were housing insecure, living with friends, family, etc. Now, the small nation's unhoused population is rapidly approaching zero. When will Bowling Green start to tailor the success stories of other places to fit her needs? I rise today to discuss inevitability and how we as a community face the future. As we speak today, our nation is in the grips of an opioid epidemic largely manufactured by the greed of pharmaceutical tycoons who through bribery and coercion pumped addiction into small towns across America. While the appearance of justice may be served through the indictment and probable conviction of a handful of high profile billionaires, the burden of suffering remains on the poor and hapless addict who believed in the physician's creed, above all, do no harm. Here, let us lead. States that have decriminalized cannabis have seen a marked reduction in opioid addiction and overdoses, an increase in government revenue, and a reduction in violent crime. Let us look to our state's agricultural heritage, to the compassion of our people, and decline to prosecute possession and distribution of cannabis in our city. Let us say today is the day Bowling Green will proudly be who she has always been, fair, just, compassionate, and forward-thinking. Commissioners, I urge you to lead first, follow only when innovation yields fruitful results, and never be dragged. This year offers new promises, new hope. There is a better path and greater wisdom before us. The onus is on you to walk it. Thanks for your time. Uh, may I ask a question? Yes, Mr. Commissioner Denning. Are you asking this body to be supportive of drug use? Did I understand a portion of your comments? I would say not. I would say that I am asking this body to consider current science and, uh, cons and to consider what other states and other localities have done and the results therein. Uh, when we talk about cannabis, when we talk about marijuana, we can't forget that uh, it is legal even on a recreational basis in several states at this point and also at this juncture the state of Kentucky is considering legalization for medical use. I am saying that we simply should look into moving forward with decriminalizing marijuana within our city. Not being supportive of drug use, per se. I'm not suggesting by any means that we need a, a crack market on every corner. This is marijuana, it's a completely different thing. Thank you. Uh, any, any other questions? Fairness, housing? I just wanna just let you know that we, so we have a copy of our meeting procedures and our binders. And so in, and that's code of ordinance chapter two. And in the part where it talks about minutes, um, you already have the right to submit your written document. It says about halfway through the paragraph um, any member of the board of commissioners or member of the public who reads a written statement at the regular or special meeting may request at that meeting that a copy of the written statement may be included in the minutes. So you, that's already, you can do that. And then that's searchable. When you go to our minutes on our website, if you submit it that way, that 
it would be searchable already. So I would like to request that a copy be submitted into the minutes. Thanks, Dana. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. That's the last item on our agenda, and we'll ask you to excuse us if you don't mind. We've got a closed session to discuss some items.